Good evening, and welcome to our live webcast of Open Book, Open Mind Online with Khalil Gibran Mohammed and Jake Silverstein talking about the 1619 Project, a new origin um, story with David Trout. The 1619 Project is a landmark re-examination of American history that places race, slavery, and their consequences at the center of our national narrative. It's the number one New York Times bestseller and has obviously attracted a lot of attention. In fact, over 600 people signed up for this discussion tonight. So welcome, all of you. I'm Ariel Zeitlin, one of the librarians at the Montclair Public Library. And first, I'd just like to draw your attention to the Q&A button. If you're using a computer or a smartphone, it's at the bottom of your screen. If you're using a tablet, it's at the top of your screen. That's how you can send us your questions for the Q&A. And it's also how you can ask for live tech help from my librarian co-host, Alex Russo, at any time during the webcast. Now, I'd like to introduce Sheila Boyd, a member of the board of our Library Foundation. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Ariel, and uh, welcome to everyone on the on both as panelists, but also who are in attendance. Uh, we're so happy that you're here for another virtual open mind open book webcast and um, I'm just happy that we have so many people signed up tonight also. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Montclair Public Library Foundation. Uh, I'm one of the directors of that foundation and we're a group of friends and neighbors who care about the library and serve to support its programs. Our mission is to raise funds to enhance the offerings that make our library so special. These offerings include library programs like this one, the Open Book, Open Mind program. We also work to provide staff development, building restoration, and other needs that aren't covered by municipal funding. Our foundation and donors support everything from laptop lending, Wi-Fi hotspots for Montclair residents without internet access, to lifelong learning classes, homework tutoring and resume help, as well as children's programming. So after you enjoy this event, please consider making a donation through our website, montclairplf.org. Gifts of all sizes have an impact and the library needs your support now more than ever. Thank you very much and please enjoy the program. Um, thank you so much for all that you do, Sheila. And if anyone in the audience wants to contribute to the library in other ways, please search for Friends of the Montclair Public Library on our website or on Facebook. Now, we're delighted to welcome two major contributors to the 16 project, 1619 project to Open Book, Open Mind tonight. Khalil J J Gibran Mohammed is the Ford Foundation Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School. Um, Khalil directs the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project. He contributed the essay on sugar to the 1619 Project, and he's also the author of The Condemnation of Blackness, which he discussed on Open Book, Open Mind some years ago. He lives in New Jersey. Welcome back, Khalil. Thank you, thank you, it's great to be here. Okay, um, we're also very glad to welcome back Jake Silverstein, a co-editor of the 1619 Project. As editor-in-chief of the New York Times Magazine, Jake commissioned the original Times Magazine special issue of the 1619 Project, um, which won a Pulitzer Prize for Nicole Hannah-Jones's opening essay. He also co-edited the book version of the project. Jake is a resident of Montclair and has always been an important booster for the library. Welcome back, Jake. Thank you, it's good to be here. Now, we're pleased to welcome tonight's moderator, David Trout. In addition to being distinguished professor of law and justice and a John J. Francis scholar at Rutgers Law School, David is the founding director of the Rutgers Center on Law, Inequality, and Metropolitan Equity, known as CLIMB. He contributes to a variety of national periodicals, inclu including Politico, The Huffington Post, Reuters, and The Crisis. He lives in Montclair. Welcome, David. It's great to be back. Thank you so much. 
Okay, so this is the moment we've all been waiting for. And for all of you at home, please remember, you can start submitting your questions while the conversation is going on. I'll be back later. Okay, thank you, Ariel. And uh, Jake, it's great to see you and to meet you. And Khalil, it's just a joy once again to hang out with you. It, it seems this is the only way it's possible, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that, David. No, it's great. And uh, Ariel didn't mention that that you were generous to moderate the discussion about my book uh, so many years ago at the library. So I, I don't think we've seen each other since. <laughs> yeah, well, well, lo lots, lots in the way, right? Like a pandemic. But, yeah. Um, but this is a fantastic project. It's um, it's really so important on so many levels. And my hope this evening, before we move to the Q and A, is to ask really about the origin of the origin story. And then to get into the book, um, beginning with your essay, Khalil, um, to talk about some of the substance, the themes that run throughout. Um, then maybe to touch upon the role of public scholarship, of which this is such an important example. And finally, to touch upon, if there's time, a little of the criticism. So let me start by uh, framing things uh, with um, uh, uh, some questions, that, some framing questions that arise in the preface written by uh, Hannah Nicole Jones, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones. She asks, what would it mean to reframe our understanding of US history with 1619 as the origin point? How would that reframing change how we understand some of the nation's problems today, like inequality, violence, segregation, incarceration, and political divisions? How might it help us understand the country's best qualities? And how would this new origin lens help us better appreciate the contributions of Black Americans? Part of that framing suggests that not only is the origin important from a historical standpoint, but it's important to understand it as a through line to the present. And I think that's probably part of the struggle. So if I could begin with you, uh, the, the struggle among, among some of the readers and the interpretation of the work itself across the country. So if I could begin with you, Jake, if you would tell us about the origin of this origin story, um, maybe giving us particular insight into the various and extraordinary works of fiction that don't always get as much attention in it, sure. and tell us how it came to be what it's become. Sure. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, David, for uh, for being here tonight and, and, and leading this conversation, first of all. Um, you know, the origin story of the 1619 project is, in a way, it's pretty simple. Nicole um, had had been always very interested in the date 1619, as she writes in the preface that you cited just now. Um, you know, and, and it just obviously we should begin with the fact that this whole project is the creation of Nicole Hannah Jones, who um, has been out talking about it and on book tours since it launched and uh, sadly couldn't be with us tonight. But um, Khalil and I will do our best to, uh, you know, to substitute for Nicole. Um, Nicole came, Nicole's a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine uh, and she and has been since 2015. She came into a um, one of our editorial meetings at the very beginning of 2019 which now feels like about a thousand years ago, right? Um, and she she said, this is the, the anniversary year. This is the 400th anniversary year of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in the British North American colonies that would become the United States. And most people don't know the significance of that year of 1619. Um, and we should do something about that. We should do a special issue of the magazine that commemorates that anniversary and educates people about the meaning of that date um, but does more than just educate people about the meaning of that date, makes a claim about the importance of the meaning of that date, that in effect, to, 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 to kind of rephrase some of the stuff that you were just quoting, David, from her preface, that reframes American history around that date as the origin point, as the starting point, as the kind of beginning of the narrative that has brought us to the present. Um, as I said, she'd been talking about 1619 for years, as she writes in her preface, she first learned the date in high school, um, uh, reading before the Mayflower, um, uh, and and it had always been on her mind that a, a project about the year 1619 that re, that that brought forward the centrality of slavery in terms of the American story would be an important one to do. So in a way, for Nicole, this project had been building up for many many years. 
Um, once she brought that idea out at this editorial meeting, I think it was in January of 2019, um, you know, it had sort of instantly seemed like a really important idea that we would want to do. Um, we spent the next six months, you know, having a series of conversations initially with amongst ourselves, editors, writers, started bringing in scholars and historians like Khalil to talk about how we could, um, how we could extend this concept that Nicole had, had introduced. And the concept was very simple. It was, if we're going to use 1619 as the origin point of a national story, one of the ways to sort of um, carry that out, to explore that would be to find elements in the present, in present day American society that have their roots in, in the system of slavery that predominated for the first 250 years of, of the country's past. Um, and so we started talking to a bunch of historians about different examples that we might seize on to kind of explore that idea. Um, and the project grew from there. You know, we, we initially thought of it as a project that would be uh, uh, um, written almost entirely by, by scholars and journalists. Then we had the notion that we might add some, some literary elements to the project as well, uh, some fiction and some poetry. Um, you know, that I think grew out of our sense that it would be an, an addition to the scholarly work to, to use some imaginative literature to explore aspects of the past that are simply not recorded in, uh, in, in written history for various reasons, which we can talk about later. Um, and so it grew to become what was published in August of 2019, a collection of 10 essays and uh, 17 works of fiction and poetry. And, you know, that was uh, a good two year, two plus years ago. And in the two years since, we've had this incredible opportunity in the midst of a really robust conversation around the project to expand it, to expand it pretty dramatically into the book form that was published in November. Thank you. So Khalil, I wanna to turn to you. Um, as I read the riveting account of the lesser known origins, atrocities and economics of sugar cultivation in 18th century Louisiana, and Black folks' chronic health conditions today, I wondered about the title of the essay. Instead of calling it Sugar, and I'm not sure how much control you had over the, the name of the chapter, but I, I wondered if it couldn't be called The Sugars. <laughs> right, as in, as in the, the disease of diabetes, right? Yeah, yeah. Now that, that's a good point um, and an apt way to think about the echoes that that history uh, attempts to get at. Um, I will admit, I, I haven't said this to Jake before, but you know, that's the fun of having a live conversation. Um, is, uh, you know, it was tough for me to, um, to make the connection to the chronic health conditions that derive from the overconsumption of sugar in American society uh, to this very old history. And while I conceptually understood it as a, you know, literally writing it, um, it was tough. And, uh, and we went through a lot of drafts in the actual storytelling, but I think the payoff was tremendous. Um, and I'll say that uh, for two reasons. One, I think it meets the um, editorial uh, focus of the project, which is to say, you know, what we eat is not an accident of nature, but in fact, a consequence of decisions, of investments. And, you know, the simplest way to emphasize the power of that story, let alone how well I told the story, is that it's not an exaggeration to say that counterfactually, uh, it's hard to imagine Europeans would have settled and or come for the purposes of extraction, which is how most Europeans came as opposed to uh, British colonists and, and Spanish colonists would have, would not have come to the new world and stayed for any length of time. Uh, they would have seen it as, uh, as a, a fallow experiment and it, an adventure that yielded very little in the way of profit. Um, there wasn't as much gold as, as people thought there was. There was some, but not certainly not enough. And in the context in which uh, colonization unfolded as history in the history that we know, not in the history we imagine. There's no way to tell that story uh, but for sugar. 
And outside of the North American British colonial context, sugar animated all forms of European settlement uh, in, in the so-called New World. It was only because of the uh, northernness and the climate of the North American continent uh, that sugar didn't have the foothold that it had uh, just 90 miles south of Florida, and most certainly all the way down to Mexico and Brazil and, and various other sugar islands. Uh, so it turns out in the end that it's a really important story to tell. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a historian, you know, a newsflash, historians in many ways, like law professors, like physicians, um, we have expertise um, that is limited. Uh, and so it was an opportunity for me to learn a deeper story that, uh, that I didn't get in school. So for all these people who say, well, we know enough about slavery, you know, it's hogwash because even as a professionally trained historian that, uh, that was certainly exposed to uh, a very full and rich story of the past um, through scholarship at Rutgers University, um, you know, 20 years later, uh, a lot of this I had to relearn in order to write this essay. It really is a fascinating account, um, especially for those of us who grew up sort of understanding American slavery through the lens of cotton and maybe maybe a little bit of rice, maybe a little bit of tobacco. But mm -hmm. from the from the global economic standpoint, sugar is the thing. Um, yeah. For, for, yeah. For, for the European powers. Um, let me move now to a theme that emerged for me in the book. Um, that uh, was really that that is and was a, a project of, of of white supremacy, and that is rationalizing hatred and all of its contradictions. This theme is evident in so many of the chapters in the book. I'll just give a few examples. In Linda Villarosa's chapter on, on how black bodies had to be understood as savage and inferior and incapable of pain, a, 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 a characterization that has followed through to the to the to the modern era uh, in terms of healthcare delivery. Um, it, you, you see it in both Leslie and Michelle Alexander's and Carol Anderson's chapters about how the violent, rebellious nature of Blacks as characterized by whites justified just the, the harshest, most persistent brutality across generations. You see that um, uh, Brian Stevenson's piece adds to this idea of Blacks having an irredeemable criminality, something, of course, that you've written about at length, Khalil. Uh, to this day, Dorothy Roberts' essay that shows how the characterization of Black women's bodies as lustful and promiscuous made them unrapeable and unworthy of protection, and how those beliefs still resonate to this day. And finally, Tremaine Lee's moving essay, where uh, showing how Black self-help and entrepreneurism was regarded as uppity and met, met consistently with violent confiscation. I really could go on because the, 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 this rationalization theme, this rationalizing hatred runs, runs throughout. But I, I, I wondered if you, if you would speak to that. I mean, was, was this, is, is this an, an, an accidental truth of history or was this something that in the editorial process and thinking about the compilation of essays was important to try to bring out? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that the that the specific theme that you've hit upon was like a, a theme that we identified before we began assigning essays and said, we need essays that will prove out that theme. But what I would say is that in a way, this is, this is what the idea of reframing history around 1619 as the beginning point rather than 1776 is all about, right? It's that like when you get to 1776, when you get to the founding era, there's a context in which that founding has happened. There's a context in which, you know, the founding fathers are, 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 are proclaiming the universal rights of man. And that context is that one fifth of the population is held in bondage. And when you have a, a nation founded on the principle that all men are created equal, but in which one fifth of the population is held in bondage, you need to come up with a rationalization for why you know, that one fifth of the population is not included in the proposition that all men are created equal. And I think that's the, that's the contradiction. That's the founding contradiction that is still such a part of so many of the institutions of American life and so many of the kind of cultural um, uh, baked in, you know, uh, systemic racism that we struggle with today comes from that founding contradiction. But you can't understand that contradiction unless you set the clock backward further and say, why, when you get to that point, 
when these very admirable ideals are being enshrined in our founding documents, what is the context in which those ideas are put forward? And when you understand the, the, you know, the, the, all of the history that came before that, beginning in 1619, I think you begin to get a, gra begin to get a grasp on why the rationalization that you put forward. And you see it, I mean, Linda Villarosa's essay is a great example. Uh, you see it in all of this, um, this junk racial science of the 19th century that tries to you know, put forward scientific reasons that, that allow you know, white Americans to cast black Americans out of the body politic and to inc not include them in the, in the kind of proposition that all men are created equal. I mean, that, that comes out of the need to rationalize uh, the, the, the fact that the founding principles don't apply to, uh, to that part of the country's population. Can I jump in on this? Because this is a it's a really great question, and uh, and I, I really appreciate actually as a as an educator being able to teach uh, the 1619 project to students who are not would be historians, which is a very different. I have lots to teach students who are graduate students who want to be historians, but if I want to teach, and as I do in a policy school, or David, I imagine in your case, teaching future lawyers, uh, sometimes it's useful to have interpretive histories that are both rich and deep in context and content, uh, but also infinitely more readable and digestible uh, than say getting buried in the academic literature, which often is picking off a very particular point um, to make a contribution. And, and in this way, I find the 1619 Project, even where there are notable differences among historians, a really great starting point for both providing basic text um, is also pointing out the stakes and one of the stakes that, that you asked about and that Jake just described, I think is really important. The rationalization is such a key part of what becomes racism and racial ideology. And you know, the simple, uh, a lot of people have come up with really great ways to say this more recently, uh, and it was harder in the past, but as journalists tend to simplify in ways that are useful to public knowledge, you know, uh, the problem of opp opp oppression and enslavement came first, the justification for it came later, which is why in a book like this, we see the progression of slave codes in the Dorothy Roberts piece as a way of explaining um, that in 1619, there was indeterminacy, there was contingency, there was uncertainty about whether or not these people from Africa would have the same fate as these people from various parts of Europe who were also in various forms of coercive bondage or it, it certainly indentured servitude. And that's a really important thing for people to get, which they don't get, because they tend to think of slavery as this container of evil that mostly greedy, evil people engaged in, and it was sort of unilinearly bad all the time. But in fact, it's not unilinearly bad. The 19th century, if we were to weigh slavery within the United States, is the most brutal period. And it's precisely the most brutal period, and this is the second point that I want to add to this conversation, because violence is a response to resistance. And so for all of those threads that you described, you don't get resistance if black people stay in their place. You don't get resistance if black people don't plan insurrection and slave revolts. You don't get resistance if black people don't say, this is unfair and an outrage and doesn't meet up to your own standards. So it's that speaking back, it's that agency, it's that resistance that consistently shows up. It is the love that is found across the so-called color line in the 17th century that generates the permanent status of those who are born to enslaved women. And that's a form of resistance itself, which is to say, who's to say who should, who should love one another? And so we get these ridiculous miscegenation laws that last up until 1967. Um, so it, it, it's really a fascinating through line that didn't have, did not have to be enforced. It is the twin evil of, of oppression for the purpose of power and extraction, the rationalization of that power and extraction in a society that becomes defined as universal liberty, as you know, David, and I'd love for you to join in this conversation on some of these points. And then thirdly, the use of terror, violence, and brutalization to maintain that system because people pushed back and challenged it. Right, yeah. Um... You know, I, as I as I listen, I, I wonder, I really wonder about uh, Ibram Kendi's conclusion um, at the end, 
Um, and I and I, I I wonder, you know, as you describe this through line, Khalil, you know, is 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 this imperative of racism to rationalize power? Um, is, is this why it's so hard to see racial progress? Um, does the view of racial progress look like one more rationalization of of racism? Because it's it's this is what most of us have grown up with. This, this notion of racial progress, as if it, you know, were, were some sort of an evolutionary fact of American identity. And it's challenged in that piece, but it's, but, but, but the mechanics of the challenge seem to run through this imperative. Yeah, I'll take a first stab at this, but I, I, I want to, I, I want to prompt Jake a response because I'm curious about storytelling. So I, I think, I mean, I think Ibram's um, notion of the parallel histories of race, racism and racial progress is, is a, a fascinating dualism that I think, you know, in terms of writing it in a way that covers the history is able to tell these two narratives at once, which is often not the case. Um, and it's partly not the case because for most of the telling of American history, particularly in venues like this, these, these national narratives, so to speak, um, it is almost always a story of a teleological notion of progress. It's the present is always better than the past. The future will always be better than the present. Partly, I think, and this is where I would love Jake to weigh in. I mean, you're constantly editing storytelling, but there is a desire to see hope in these stories. And so I think what, what Ibram has done, you know, in a, in a good way, a service really is to say, well, if we're going to hold on to these narratives of progress in a way that are demonstrable, right? You know, the period of the revolutionary era gives us gradual abolition, which creates the context for anti-slavery to take root in the country. We get reconstruction. You know, we get various instances of back of pushing back towards uh, freedom in the Great Migration period. I'm just sort of marking the obvious points along the chronology, and of course, the civil rights movement and beyond. So. You know, if you're trying to tell a story and maintain the credibility that can account for the nuance and the complexity, um, even if your story is one of a kind of what we say ever changing same when it comes to the shape shifting nature of systemic racism, then you kind of need these other points in order to have those two things in common. And I applaud I Abram for being able to do that in the way that I think was unique and original. Uh, to the writing of this kind of long durée of American history, but 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 you know I'm not the guy who's editing uh, stories all the time, and I'm curious, you know, uh, how much is is it a part of the craft itself of storytelling that these that these stories have to maintain the sense of optimism and hope, you know, in in the protagonist, so to speak. Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, certainly the the way that the American story has been told up until what 30, 40, 50 years ago really, really emphasized the idea of progress uh, and, and of sort of providential destiny that, you know, um, maybe maybe we had some problems to overcome in the past, but you know, but we were founded on these shining ideals and we've been working toward um, toward, toward bringing them into reality for all Americans and, and that uh, we're a beacon of, of liberty and self-government for all the world. And I think, you know, it, it's really only been in the last 30 to 40, 30 to 50 years that there's been a, a counter narrative that um, has challenged that. And so, you know, I think, I think there's, it's certainly the case that as far as storytelling about, about American history, um, that a, a narrative that was built around um, faith in progress was, is just kind of baked into our most basic like fairy tales and mythologies about who we are as a country. Um, and I mean, you know, look, I think a lot of the, David, you mentioned wanting to talk about some of the criticism. I think a lot of the, the, the criticism of the project, not all of it, but some of it, um, and, and more broadly, some of the backlash to, to kind of teaching critical history generally is, is about a, a really just profound discomfort uh, among many Americans with the idea that we have a more complicated history than that. And that, you know, it's not to deny that there has been progress, but that as, as I think Ibram really brilliantly demonstrates in that essay that the progress has, 
has gone has kind of moved in tandem with backlash for for I mean particularly on issues of race and racism for almost our entire history. You see it happening literally right now, literally right now. You see it happening, and and it's been that way forever. And that's part of what I think is powerful about uh, Ibram's essay and hopefully about the book itself is that it explains what we see happening us around us right now. It explains the the way that there can be this. How can there be this outpouring of, of multiracial support in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder for what you know may have been the largest protest movement in American history that summer, followed so quickly by a, a crackdown on voting rights, a crackdown on, on teaching American history in the classroom, a backlash that's really pretty dramatic that we're seeing happening right in front of us right now. How can those two things happen so proximate in time? And I think the project helps give an explanation for why that is so. Yeah. You know, um, I should I should note uh, personally, it's difficult reading. You know, it's 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 painful reading. Um, even for those of us who were fortunate enough to grow up, I found my copy with um, you know, with with before the Mayflower. You know, <laughs> on, on the shelf, um, but it it may be particularly difficult because of the omission of the good white throughout these stories. You know, from a storytelling standpoint, that's one of the notable aspects of the book. And it took me about halfway through it to realize where is he, and he's usually he, right? He usually enters at some point in the story to sanitize or soften the blow of so much traumatic reading to learn. You know, remember there is this guy who steps in on behalf of justice and our, you know, our our, our better principles. Anyway, um, let me let me move on to the book as as uh, as public scholarship. Um, again, in can, can I, yeah, David, right. before you say that, I just I, I'm biting at the uh, uh, chomping at the bit to say this, but you know, this is where John Brown, the insurrectionist. Uh, of, of 1857 is an, is Antifa in our current moment, right? So there's a there's a kind of nostalgia for a universal um, uh, heroism that gets attached to this mythic past of which there are really no villains except you know maybe the caricature of the Ku Klux Klan and a few greedy slaveholders, but in fact most people stood on the side of justice. But in the same way that today. People have a really hard time with the notion that you might actually have to defend protesters' right to protest against a tyrannical police or vigilantes um, misses the point, right? Um, and so we're not really even talking about real people um, in, in terms of our public conversation about white heroism. We're, we're really talking about mythical figures. Um, I mean, William Lloyd Garrison was insufferable to most people who even objected to slavery because he was, you know, he was so committed uh, to a vision of America that was contrary to how even in the 19th century people imagined their own country. Um, and, and that's the point. Like, so what, what you're really talking about are stock characters who we need in these stories so that, it, it, and the we here being white people need to see themselves in these stories. But but really the truth is the version of themselves that that it was there all along is not the version that they actually identify with in the present. Yeah. Can I add one more point to that? Because this is something that's come up a lot in the discussion around the project is the treatment of Lincoln, one of our ultimate mythic good whites in American history, the treatment of Lincoln in Nicole's essay, which I think is an eye is eye opening for many, many Americans who, you know, who are who are not historians. Um, who what they know of Abraham Lincoln is you know what they what they learned in high school and and maybe saw in a movie and to understand his that he had that he was not entirely convinced on the equality of Black Americans though he came to to you know uh, to to lead um, uh, the war that would that would end slavery that the idea that even the great emancipator um, uh, had the views that he held on black equality and the idea that that the that for for Lincoln initially at least emancipation would have to be followed by colonization by the shipping of black americans into it to a different country entirely because the idea that black and white americans could never live side by side that even Lincoln our, our great emancipators like held those views not necessarily until the end of his life but for significant parts of his political career it i think it helps explain to readers the perniciousness of something you raised before, David, which is this 
what happens when you have to justify slavery? What happens when you have to justify racism? You develop a doctrine of inequality. And that doctrine of inequality lives on even in, even in some of our heroes of racial justice, like Abraham Lincoln and beyond, all the way to the present. I think that that's why it's so important for, um, you, you know, for the, the vision of Lincoln that is really surprising. And I think even shocking to some people who read this book and who read Nicole's essay. This is why it's so important to convey that aspect of, of his political career. Yeah, and it's, it's garnered just the, the criticism you would expect. But before we get to that, let me let me ask about this in in, in the broader context of doing public scholarship. Um, again, in, in in Nicole's preface, um, she situates the book, the project, in public history or or public scholarship. And and my understanding of public scholarship as a public scholar is is that it differs from tr traditional scholarship in the burden of public impact that it takes on. Um, it's not just knowledge for knowledge's sake. It wants to reach a broader public, which means that it is engaged in the project of confronting power and it will upset people routinely. Um, black scholars and others have been engaged in the public scholarship project about America's origins for decades. Um, this is a lot of what it has meant to be a black scholar. Um, and so I'm wondering where does the 1619 project fit in this larger project, do you think? Um, what, do you, what do you think its fate will be? It's certainly bigger, grander. It's got much more attention than many of the efforts before. You know, uh, we all probably came up in the era when the canon was being questioned in many different fields. Um, we were probably college students when things got turned on their heads you know, the demands for a less ethnocentric curriculum. Um, the birth of a lot of public scholars comes out of that tumult. And so wherever we are today is part of that project. But now we have this. Um, what can we imagine its effect might be, say, in a generation? I want you to take it because you, you wrote this great essay that, uh, that, you know, I think you should share some insights from, yeah. All right. Well, I was going to say I also want, I want to hear from the, the person who I'll say molding molding scholars. Khalil can talk to us about how the future generations might uh, might respond to this. But I mean, what 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 I will say is that from the perspective of of you know those of us who were editing the project, I mean, you know, we were very much aware that what we were doing was bringing to a very wide audience um, insights and scholarship that had been. Uh, accepted in, you know, amongst academic historians for the, the you know, the last 30 to 50 to 40 years, um, and, but that had really not penetrated public consciousness and are still, I would say, still penetrating public consciousness, still working to penetrate public consciousness, uh, still working against uh, the opposition of many state legislators around the country to penetrate public consciousness. And, and those have to do with the centrality of slavery and the and its aftermath and its legacy in American life, um, and you know we we understood that the a project that we did that that reframed American history around that centrality would um, would have a lot of value in the sense that it it was doing a, a kind of public service of bringing a great deal of important scholarship that that I think. Um, helps explain where we are as a country today in a way that previous versions of our story do not, that it would help bring that to a much wider audience, but that it would also, you know, certainly face some backlash. I will be honest, the, the level of backlash that we faced, I did not fully anticipate. I don't think any of us imagined that, you know, a, a year after publishing the project, there would be a presidential executive commission dedicated to debunk debunking it. You know, that's, that's not something that was on our bingo card, um, but perhaps it should have been because you know when you look at at uh, previous efforts to bring forward. I mean, David, you mentioned that for Black scholars, that so often the work of public history has often been kind of a work that is in, engaged in kind of pushing back against a narrative. Um, that's that's certainly the case, and 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 if you look at a lot of previous examples of of efforts to bring forward a more critical history, um, Khalil referenced the 
uh, this essay. Well, one of the uh, themes of that essay was that the, the wars over the national history standards in the early 90s. That's a great previous example of a more complicated, nuanced, multiracial version of the American story that scholars attempted to introduce under the guise of these national history standards, standards that would that would inform curricula that history teachers and social studies teachers were teaching around the country in the early 90s. And it was met with just ferocious backlash that was very political in nature. It was, it was aligned in terms of uh, the, the timing of it with the uh, Republican, Gingrich-led Republican Revolution in 1994. That moment, I think, is very instructive. I don't know if we have time to get into it, but that moment is very instructive because what we have been experiencing for the last two years is really an echo of that moment. And if, if anybody listening is interested, I would recommend a book that was written by the, the folks who wrote those history standards about the experience that they went through in terms of the backlash to their work. Uh, that book's called History on Trial and the principal author is Gary Nash, a great historian who died last summer. Um, anyway, I, I, the, the, um, the way in which the project has kind of both brought greater awareness to this scholarship, but also um, you know, become embroiled in some of these cyclical controversies around how to teach a more critical version of American history um, you know, it, it has been a real eye opener for a lot of us. Yeah, and uh, so that Jake's piece is called a, um, a Nation of Arguments, right? I got that right. That's the title, right, Jake? Yeah. And so it, it's not in the book and it wasn't in the original project, but it was in the magazine uh, just before the book released for those who, who aren't familiar. It's a really wonderful piece uh, to kind of tell the arc of this history. But David, I want to make two quick points. One, you ask the question, how will we look back on this? And I think it is fair to say um, we have never seen a publication, a singular publication, if we think of the magazine and the book in tandem, that has been written into so many legislative bills and been subjected to so many local elections and or school board decision making about whether its content is appropriate or not appropriate uh, for teaching than anything else, maybe the save for the Bible. Um, I mean, there, there are most certainly cases of banned books um, across the spectrum of, of engagement around this country and what's appropriate for young people. Uh, but I think the 1619 Project literally broke the mold for identifying a singular body of work around history that uh, has generated so much legislative and policy making activity. Now, the second point I want to make is to explain why that's so important. And this gets to black scholars. I would argue, and I think no one who contributed uh, either as an editor or a journalist would say that this book could have been written without the work of scholars, in including perhaps disproportionately black scholars who have taken the lead in writing those counter narratives to tell those stories uh, in a more truthful, fuller and honest way. And one could argue that had this been a work published by a black publication and had the same content, this would not go anywhere in the way that it had. That when Sean Wilentz at Princeton raises his initial objection to the factual claims in Nicole's piece, he adds to that the concern that the, the imprimatur of the New York Times on this makes this so much more problematic. Because, well, God forbid, uh, Nicole have written uh, for the GRIO and, and written the same essay, well, then, you know, it's just part of the marketplace of ideas. Some are more credible than others. And so we do have to acknowledge that it was the scale and reach of essentially black scholarship by way of this compilation and anthology of these ideas that was so threatening um, and that really cut to the heart of the matter you know if, if sean were in this conversation i'd say to him why not have the same objections to the empirical evidence of the misrepresentation of history that already exists in so many of our classrooms in so many state standards. Where have you been all these years? And so it's one thing to say there's something wrong with this version. It's another thing to say that the status quo is OK, um, because it's not, and it never has been. And I think that black voice showing up at scale um, caused or contributed to. The last thing quickly I'll say is that uh, whether or not there would have been scholarly 
backlash to the initial magazine issue, I think it's fair to say probably so. The fact that it got legs, I think, was a consequence of both Trumpism, broadly defined, and then secondarily the summer of George Floyd, which did happen a year later. But the legislative acts happened in the wake of the summer of George Floyd. And so the potential for a generation of white Americans, particularly young white Americans, to be influenced by the 1619 Project, to then take to the streets and protest for racial justice, to me, is the fundamental threat that the project posed in real time for legislators who saw, like, I, like this has real consequences for how people think about this country and what they're willing to do about it. Well, that, that may be an answer to my last question before I turn to the Q&A, but I, I, I do wanna give you both an opportunity to speak to the criticism. And I, I, you know, I, I didn't study all the criticism. I'm not going to recount all the criticism. Um, I was struck that it, what, I, what I did read in four or five pieces seems mostly pointed at two claims that uh, Nicole makes in the, in, in the preface and, and maybe one that I'm not sure Matthew Desmond even makes, but, but suggests in his essay on capitalism. I mean, I thought may, maybe it was possible that many of the critics just, just didn't read the whole book, but, um, but that's, that's not fair. I, I'll, let's, let's assume in good faith that they did. And, um, and they obviously come from not just the right and not just from, from, from angry legislators afraid that you know, their children will be reading critical race theory and, 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 and you know, uh, subject to white shame or guilt or the kinds of things that we see school boards say, but that some of these are um, either factual disputes or they're framing disputes. Um, and I, I just wanna give you an opportunity to, to, to respond. Sure. Um, I mean, it, it, there's obviously a lot to respond to, and I don't think we have time to get into all of it. But, you know, one of the principal uh, criticisms um, of the entire project has come down to this one single sentence in Nicole's uh, essay that is about the motivations of the, of the uh, colonists that decided to um, fight the Revolutionary War and separate from, from the mother country, from England. Why do they do so? And what Nicole initially wrote, we did make an uh, amendment to it in the magazine issue. What she initially wrote was that um, conveniently left out of our founding mythology is the fact that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare their independence from Britain was to protect the institution of slavery. Um, what we added later on is the, word, is the phrase some of, conveniently left out of our founding mythology is the fact that some of the reason, the primary motivation of some of the colonists. And look, I mean, certainly it, it would be wrong to say that the primary motivation of the American Revolution was the protection of slavery. Um, you know, but that's not what we said. Uh, what we said was that the among the motivations of the of the um, of those who were fighting the Revolutionary War was the protection of slavery. Now, I don't know that we have enough time to get deeply into all the reasons why that is, you know, that's substantiated in the historical literature. But one simple point I would make is that what Nicole is, uh, the point that Nicole is making in that sentence is, is even more than it's a historical point, it's a historiographical point, right? What she's saying is conveniently left out of our founding mythology is this fact, right? And what so many people have seized on in that point is the idea that, well, what she's saying is that the entire revolution was fought to preserve uh, pre preserve slavery, and that's just wrong. But really what she's saying is that we have a founding mythology. That founding mythology holds the reason that the revolution was fought was to, to you know, to be, to strike for independence and, and, in, and, and to create a, a, a republic uh, founded on the ideal of liberty um, and, and the equality of all people. And what Nicole is saying is that left out of that founding mythology is an inconvenient, an inconvenient fact, which is that for some of those colonists, the protection of the institution of slavery from British meddling was paramount in their decision to go to war. And you know, this is a, a big theme of a recent book by the scholar Woody Holton, which is called Liberty is Sweet. He just, Woody just published that book in, in October. And uh, in the advance, running up to the publication of the 1619 Project in November, 
Woody Holton, a scholar from Virginia, uh, published one piece of evidence in defense of the idea that there were some colonists who were motivated to, uh, uh, to join the Patriot cause by the idea that um, that their system of slavery was going to was 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 um, was not secure under British rule, um, Woody tweeted out on Twitter one piece of evidence in defense of that per day for seventy six days leading up to, to to November. So you know, again, I don't know that we got time to like go into every single one of those pieces of evidence, but I will just say there's plenty of historical literature to support that claim. It's a controversial claim. But again, I think it's important to recognize that what she's saying, what Nicole is saying in that much debated claim is a point that's about the way we tell the story, not as much as it is about the historical facts themselves. Yeah, I just wanna add well, one quick thing. And this is something that I think uh, may illuminate um, the point. I think Nicole does an actually a, a very good job in the revision um, dealing with the role of Virginia as a key colony in the question about the revolution itself. And while she doesn't say this in her text, uh, there's a really important point to emphasize, which is to say um, the nation had to do the dirty, or I should say the difficult work of coming together to agree upon a constitution that needed to be ratified in order to actually establish the United States. And on that score, so uh, from the time of the end of the revolution to the Constitutional uh, Convention, which was a, a matter of months, the ultimate sticking point <laughs> was resolving the future of slavery. So the notion that some colonists were more concerned about the future of slavery in the run up to the war and whether or not that institution would be more secure as a colony of Britain or as an independent nation bears out in grand fashion in the actual constitution debate, constitutional debates about what it would take to agree upon the actual laws of the nation of which we know those compromises play, bear fruit. So we actually have to suspend everything we know about what comes next in order to dismiss any notion that slavery factored into some of the debate about the Revolutionary War, war itself. Um, so I'll just add that to the long list of people weighing in on this. Well, thank you. And there, there, there were audience questions about that. Let me raise another from Olivia, who um, uh, notes that um, this is about language and the language of history. Um, she'd heard something recently uh, a discussion where forced labor camps was used um, as a term to describe um, plantation, it's a more accurate term to describe plantations. That pl plantations um, are, you know, where people have, uh, they feel comfortable, they hold proms and they hold weddings. And so just this juxtaposition of language is at the core of her question. And she asks, what is the role of the educator, the politician, the parent in transforming the language around history? Well, I would love to hear Khalil's take on that, but I will just quickly before that, just explain a little bit about what our thinking was in the book about how we use language. Um, obviously this is a book in which there are, I think about 52 contributors. So it's difficult to standardize uh, certain like a style guide about language across 52 different contributors who represent different fields. But that said, it was important to us and Nicole really led the way in, in some, of these, um, some, of, some of these decisions. It was important to us to do a couple of things. One, to try to avoid the word slave and instead use the word enslaved person. Um, it's a subtle distinction, but I think, every, I think everybody listening can understand why that's an important distinction. Um, you know, maintaining the humanity of the enslaved person not not uh, uh, stripping it in the, by the use of the word slave. Um, that's it. That was an important thing, and we 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 followed that as much as we could. You know, some of the other terminology that we tried to observe, like avoiding euphemisms like plantation. Um, you know, it's not universal. That's not universally the case throughout every single page of the book. Uh, certainly, you encounter that word, and and um, it, there's just it's a lot of times it was a matter of context. Um, another really important thing that we tried to avoid was the use of the passive construction when talking about racial violence. Often we talk about 
you know, uh, a, a person was lynched, but we don't talk about who did the lynching. And so it was very important to try as much as possible, again, within reason, to avoid using passive constructions and letting perpetrators of racial violence sort of hide in the grammar. Um, so we did try to pay a lot of attention to language in the book. Um, but as I said, there's 52 different contributors and, you know, different contexts for every single piece and every single sentence. So it was, it was complicated in, in, in practicality to kind of work that out in every case. But those were our ideas. Those were our principles going into it as far as language went. And I'll just say quickly on the forced labor camp, you know, my mother uh, often taught me growing up to pick and choose your battles. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because I am essentially bound by the uh, professional standards that, you know, as a historian, I wasn't willing to make an argument for redefining plantations as forced labor camps um, in order to have the ideas and arguments of my piece be heard for what they were doing. Um, that's a choice that we make um, as authors. And so for me, um, you know, I'm very mindful of what it is that I am um, pursuing in the way of an intervention, you know, in this case, a, either a historiographical one, a historical one, or the language itself. And so I was, you know, completely on board with everything else that Jake said. I wasn't comfortable uh, changing from plantation to forced labor camps. Tanya asks a very practical question. Uh, she wants to know if the 1619 project is being adopted in higher education curricula. And I, I was more broadly curious to know how you expect the book to be used. Uh, it's a good question, but we happen to have a, you know, somebody who has been teaching elements of the book here tonight. So maybe Khalil can take it. Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I don't know that anyone knows uh, what anyone's teaching with any authority uh, or, or comprehensive knowledge. I have been teaching the 1619 Project since the magazine issue. And I've been teaching it um, for good reason, which is to say that uh, as, a, as a work of contemporary um, uh, knowledge, uh, both in journalistic essay form as well as historiography, you know, it's incredibly rich. Uh, and I'm teaching just for context, graduate students um, in a policy school. So they are neither undergraduates nor future historians. And it's very rich, not only for what is in the magazine and now the book, but it's also rich for the controversies that surround it. And that was, you know, so what I would say is that uh, in higher education there, I guess I do, I'm thinking about something else. I've also seen a lot of universities use the 1619 Project as common readings for freshman students. So I would say that um, just anecdotally, there's been a fairly wide adoption of the project in one form or another in higher education. Yeah, and if I can just add one quick thing, that's just kind of a resource, David. Um, the Our partner, our education partner, uh, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed has been the Pulitzer Center, which is a really incredible organization um, that supports global journalism and also in some cases turns that that journalism that they support into uh, curricular materials that can be used in the classroom. Um, they were our partner from, from the very beginning on this in terms of converting what we created as, as a magazine and now in a book form into something that could be used in the classroom. Um, and they, they've, they've just been incredibly uh, uh, you know, visionary in how they have come up with ways for teachers to use this. And they've created this really cool network of teachers now so that what they have is and people can check it out by going to 1619education.org which is not a part of the new york times it's the pulitzer center site they have these teacher networks where teachers are sharing with each other how they're using the project what students are you know what, what kinds of lessons students are responding to teachers can use like lesson plans that other teachers have created in other parts of the country they can have conversations about you know, what's the best way to teach this material. So that, that's an incredible resource. If anybody's interested, if there's any educators listening, it's really worthwhile checking out. Thanks for that. Um, let's see, Rhonda asks, um, I recently heard a critic of the 1619 Project ask that if racism is in America's DNA, like a biological code, 
does that imply that it cannot ever be changed? Perhaps a mutation, but never changed? I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, I find this one of the most um, uh, disingenuous criticisms of the project. Um, and that is to say that if you listen to a lot of the uh, elected officials who have uh, either authored bills, defended such bills, banning the teaching of either the 1619 Project or teaching about race and racism, um, one of their key talking points is the notion that America is quote unquote irredeemably racist. And so um, our DNA <laughs> is full of junk. Um, you know, to some degree, all of us have um, predispositions to various diseases. Uh, that can manifest themselves depending on our envir environmental exposure. Um, none of this is controversial in terms of biological sciences, but apparently um, the notion that we had a very flawed foundation in terms of the actual execution of universal liberty, which, I, my God, if that's controversial, then we're, we're even further lost than, than I imagine, which is to say that, you know, pick the metaphor du jour, crack in the foundation, flaw in the DNA, whatever. So the point is that it's something we've been working on and we've succeeded at times and we've lost ground at others. Uh, and that's it, right? So the point, and, and it's, a, it's another thing that, you know, maybe this is a little bit too much of the audience of the converted or it's talking to the choir, who knows who's, who's out there. But the, the point in part of commemorating the 400th anniversary is also to take stock that it, in the year 2019, America still had the largest imprisoned and or population under correctional supervision anywhere in the world and unprecedented rates uh, per capita and expenditures through the roof, $100 billion in policing, $80 billion in prisons. And so in the land of the free and the home of the brave, you know, maybe I sound like a radical crazy person to suggest that with all this freedom, we have a lot of people who are captive to one degree or another. So we can go to bed at night saying to ourselves, we have a lot of terrible people in our country. And even if we made that argument, then the notion that like, how is it that this great country keeps producing such so many bad people? So no matter how you get around it, part of this project was to offer historical understanding of the ways in which punitiveness in American society is tied to this history of slavery, no matter how we might want to turn away from it. And that doesn't mean that it has to be with us forever, but it does mean that if we don't face that history, it, we will be less equipped to deal with our present and future. And, and I would just add to that, which is you know so well said that, I mean, to the question of, of whether the country is redeemable, whether this sort of you know uh, um, systemic racism in our DNA is redeemable. I mean, I guess the, the answer that I would give to that is we will see, right? I mean. It, again, it's like only 50 years since we've really had true democracy, roughly speaking, in this country. And, you know, we're, we're seeing a bunch of back backtracking on that right now. Um, so, you know, starting in the 1960s, not only did we have a, a more true democracy in this country, but we also had a more, a more honest uh, reckoning with our history begin around that time. And we're still kind of in, frankly, if you look at the grand you know, uh, scheme of the last 400 years of time, we're still in the in the early stages of, of seeing how that's going to play out. How is it going to play out to have a true multiracial democracy? How is it going to play out to have a true multiracial narrative about our past? And, you know, the, the, only, the only way that we're going to redeem that past is by having a multiracial democracy and having a multiracial story about our past that more accurately represents what actually happened. So I guess the question of like, is it redeemable? Like we will see, we're in the midst of trying to, trying to redeem it right now, aren't we? No, <laughs> I mean, well, yes, right. but no, <laughs> right. but, 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 but a great many of us are willing to take up arms right. um, and uh, to, to assert all kinds of things that, that, you know, that, that, that uh, defy truth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in 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 the service of a of a of a of a contrary project, um, a project that seems very much wedded to 
the initial project in 1619 at the, at the core of this project, the project of white supremacy. Tanya asked, why do you think there's such widespread resistance to the historical racial truths in this country? You know, and, 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 and your answer, Jake, and, and, and forgive me, but it sounds a little bit, you know, I, I struggle with the same answer with the same question, by the way, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not criticizing you, but it strikes me it, it, uh, uh, as uh, a little bit like, like Barack Obama's quote, you know, about, about you know, where he's, you know, he, he doesn't quite want to concede that the arc of history bends towards justice because it's not, he's not quite sure, <laughs> but at the same time, he doesn't want to repudiate that idea because, you know, um, you know, what would it be if the first black president were, were, were to, you know, hollow out that hope, right? It is part of his job and his function, just as it is part of all of our jobs and our function, you know, to, to wake up and be hopeful that the atrocities that have characterized the past, that the struggles of our ancestors are not our children's struggles. And yet um, here we live in this age where there is such a uh, tremendous resistance, even to the very truths, historical truths. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, one could argue you don't have skin in this game. This is, <laughs> this, is, this, is not, this is not your guilt to have. This is not your shame to feel. And yet there obviously is tremendous shame. There obviously is tremendous guilt, and there's obviously tremendous power fueling the resistance. So, back to this 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 question: Why do you think it persists, and 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 can we overcome it with good and important writing? Wow, well, I mean. Yeah, please, Khalil, that's a tough question. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on this. I mean, so we all struggle with this question, but here's how I think about it. And I, I don't know that this is, this is truth so much as it is a perspective. So I think of the nation as 30% of the country are neo-Confederates um, and probably never to change um, unless there's some serious re-education going on there, but the, the, they're locked in at 30%. And then you've got 30% of people who um, are, you know, what we call today progressives or anti-racist, you know, it's hard to know exactly everything about them, but they have a, a commitment to some kind of justice that is active, intentional, and engaged. And so, so, so that's kind of the pillars. And then you've got this 40% of white Americans who can go either way. And they go either way depending on the moment, they go either way depending on what's at stake, the politics, the, the mood of the country. You know, people puzzle so much about how, you know, the same people in Michigan could have voted for Obama twice and then voted for Trump. Well, they're that 40, they're in that 40%. And part of it is that the stakes, you know, they have real needs and the stakes of fulfilling those needs can come by way of New Deal type politics and policies or by way of Trumpist politics. And it just depends on the moment. So for me, what's at stake is upsetting that balance. A project like this has the potential of disrupting that balance and potentially at least for a generation, for two generations, these cycles tend to go in 50 year increments, moving the needle of that 40% in the middle far more to the 30% who are the progressive anti-racist. And perhaps not since the 1960s have we seen the potential for that significant number of white Americans to be pushed to a project of anti-racism, of uh, democratic socialism, of anti-capitalism, of, of some notion of trade unionism. I mean, there are lots of ways that we can define the sets of politics and ideas that would push back aggressively against incredible inequality that exists in this country, hardwired racism that exists across multiple axes, including the bigotry that transgender people face uh, in this country, just as the kind of one issue du jour. Um, and that to me is what's at stake. Something like this has the potential to change how people think about who they are and what their obligations to others are in this country. And that is scary to that 30% to be sure. Um, how, how important to this project is the celebration of blackness? You know, um, it, it, it happens that the 400th anniversary coincided with, you know, a, a kind of a, an Armageddon 
for black people uh, in, in, in terms of police brutality, in terms of the disproportionate risk and deaths from COVID, so much of the fragility of black life, so much of the weathering that is that runs descriptively through so many of the pieces, um, you know, is, is uh, 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 was revealed in the last couple of years, and it led to great protests, of course, against systemic racism, but all at a time when it has been increasingly difficult to say black people's names. Um, certainly in law, we experience this. We know that racially disparate impact has changed very little over so many of the important variables of access to opportunity. So we see it in healthcare, we see it in education, we see it in employment. You know, we're, we're, we're constantly challenged by a constitutional order that disallows the claim of racial harm against black people. It has, we, we have to rely upon all sorts of euphemisms because really the law has been tortured to, to make us invisible. Other people, other groups can assert their rights in their own names, but increasingly black people have been unable to do that at a time, as I say, when so many harms against black people and not exclusively black people, but disproportionately black people have accumulated in, in the public eye. And so along comes this book that, that centers blackness, not just black pain, but black resiliency and black power and blackness as Americanness. How important was that to the project? Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you asked that question because I think that often when people think about the project and what the the reframing of American history around 1619 means, they think about it in terms of, well, that's when the New York Times and Nicole are telling me that slavery began and, and kind of American racism began. And so by, by saying that's the beginning, what they're telling me is that the whole story is about slavery and racism. That's what our whole story is about. And, and obviously that is part of what happens in 1619. But the other thing that 1619 commemorates is the beginning of sort of African America, right? The beginning in the country that becomes the United States of the African presence. And part of what we're saying by using 1619 as the starting point is to say that that story that begins at, on that day, on that year, and continues to the present is a, is a heroic story. It's a story that all of us, uh, all Americans can be proud of. And it's a story that when you begin to understand what has been overcome and the resilience and resistance that it's taken to overcome that is like the quintessence of American exceptionalism, right? That American exceptionalism, a big part of American exceptionalism is African-American exceptionalism. That the idea of this country as a land of democracy and freedom has been manifested by Black struggle and by a Black freedom movement. That's just not something that I think most Americans fully understand. It's just really not. You know, to me, that's one of the, the biggest revelations of Nicole's Pulitzer Prize winning essay is that what she's saying is that the Black freedom struggle has been the engine of the perfection to the extent that we've gotten to the point of perfection of American democracy, of the ideals of American democracy, that Black struggle to be enfranchised in the, uh, in, the, in, in the democratic American Democratic Republic has led to the enfranchisement of many other people in America, that that has been the engine through which we have accomplished so much in this country. And I, you know, if there's anything that I wish people would focus on more in the 1619 Project, it's that. It's that aspect of the book. I really hope people read the book and understand that you know, it, does, it does contain many hard truths that I think uh, Americans have to, um, have to learn how to kind of reckon with, but it also contains this, this narrative that we should just all be so proud of as Americans, as our legacy, as something that, again, all of us, not just Black Americans, but all Americans can consider their inheritance. That, that I think is, is something that's to be celebrated and something that's to be taught, something that's to, to be better understood. And I hope that the 1619 Project, you know, uh, gets that point across to a lot of readers. Yeah, in the interest of time, I'll just say ditto. And my, perhaps my, I don't know if I want to claim it's my favorite essay, but certainly amongst my favorite essays and and definitely favorite 1619 podcast was Wesley Morris's uh, History of Music. 
uh, just just wonderful. And uh, and I you know I, I teach a lot about culture you know uh, in my teaching, and so it's really important to push back the proposition that there's anything that you could actually explain in American history but for the presence and proximity of these people of African descent. I mean, it's just, it's an impossible proposition to get through without sounding ridiculous uh, after so long. So anyway, yes, yes to, to, to the celebration of blackness. And can I just say one thing too for readers who are looking for an entry point to the book, uh, the incredible, incredible essay by Martha Jones about uh, citizenship and the colored conventions movement is a great case study in this point about like the struggle for, you know, uh, the black freedom struggle leading to rights that are enjoyed by all people today. That's a great entry point for anyone. Yeah, it's really not fair to start talking about favorite essays. There are so many <laughs> really wonderful essays in this. We've got time for one more question, but before we we, we get to it, I, I do want to ditto uh, Khalil's point about Wesley Morris's essay and also reference um, uh, American essentialism, exceptionalism, as, as, uh, as, as you uh, called it, Jake, in that essay um, in which he, you know, his, his, his analysis of minstrelsy is just so profound. Um, the impersonation by blacks of the impersonation of blacks, you know, just the, 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 the you know, the, all the Freudian dynamics that are going on in this 80 to 100 year struggle over music performance racial performance, identity and connection. I mean, my own grandfather went on a, on a it was was a had a minstrel, was part of a minstrel band in, in in the coal mines of Kentucky. And Wesley Morris's piece is really fascinating in that respect. But let me ask finally uh, from Stan a question that I think many people have had and, and that is how what and how should our conversations be with those who oppose the project? How do we engage in a discussion that's meaningful to both sides without going into an emotional maelstrom about change? Well, I would love to hear what Khalil has to, to say about that, but I would I would simply say that so, you know, this is a project that, again, not uh, what we expected exactly, but has be, it, this is a project that has become the center of a culture war. You know, I mean, it is absolutely the center of a culture war and a culture war, uh, is politically useful for those who are seeking electoral office or those who are, you know, in any kind of in any kind of elected position. It, a culture war is useful for stirring up your voters, for getting people upset and angry, et cetera, mobilizing people. But it also is just like incredibly obscuring about the thing itself. Like anything, anytime something becomes part of a culture war, it just becomes cartoonified. So a lot of the resistance, the fear, the anger that we see toward the project is a result of it, of the way it's been cartoonified by the, 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 the fact of it getting kind of swept up in a culture war. And I'm not in any way suggesting there aren't, you know, good faith criticisms of the project, but so much of the, so many of the criticisms that we see are part of that um, politically motivated culture war. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is perhaps too, too obvious of an answer to the question, but I would say, just tell people to please read it, you know, <laughs> just please take the time to read it. It's a long book. There's a lot of parts to it. Maybe don't, don't, they don't have to read the whole thing, but, you know, read a couple of the essays, read the fiction and the poetry, which is just um, so such a, a, a powerful and kind of inventive way to enter into some of this history. And as you're doing so, you know, recognize that this is all of our history, right? This is a shared history. Um, this is an attempt to kind of bring that history into the present and show why it still matters. Um, and I think if you, if, if people who have questions or objections to the project, just take some time to actually read it and put aside the noise around it, I think they might, they might find themselves, you know, being able to engage with it more deeply than they thought. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with the call to, uh, to read for yourself rather than simply following your favorite pundit. Um, but I do think there's a larger crisis 
um, that I don't have an answer to. I think this this is an, a problem that we simply don't have an answer to. And that is, if we can't convince people of the science of vaccination in the midst of a global pandemic, it's kind of hard to also imagine what the arguments are to read the 1619 Project for those folks. So if we're talking about that 40% that I described earlier, um, my guess is that it, it is a conversation that's worth having um, and a, a bit of patience can go a long way and maybe some baby steps um, into you know, a series of um, how would you explain this versus that um, if, if what this project is doing isn't true. I mean, for uh, this is a, kind of my last anecdote. Candace Owens, who is a prominent black woman, um, um, public celebrity on the right. She's not a scholar or anything like that. She's not a journalist, uh, but she appeared um, a few years ago uh, to basically communicate a lot of Trumpist point, talking points. And so she's grown in celebrity. She recently criticized Trump about two weeks ago for um, basically saying that the vaccines work and that people should get them. So this is Candace always criticizing Trump for saying the vaccines work. Um, and the reason she said that he made a mistake was because he's still reading the New York Times and the Washington Post and that he ought to read alternative sites on the internet. So I use that anecdote because if you're talking to people who really think that the New York Times and the Washington Post are the alternative sites of uh, fiction and that these other sites are the ones that are getting at the real truth, then I would not say waste your time. I would, you know, don't waste your time. <laughs> but but if so you might come up with a kind of litmus test for whether you can actually have patience and have this conversation about the 1619 project um, because I think that's what this has come to there are some people where this is this is never going to work out for them in terms of being convinced that it's worth any investment and they will see it uh, as an existential threat to their worldview and to the country that they uh, uh, express a love for um, and, you know, I, I think there are a lot of people in that 40% who can be convinced of these things, but I do think that there's probably some ways to, uh, to assess the value of your time in making that effort. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Ariel? Thank you, David. Really. Thank you, David. Really great. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I owe you lunch. This is two times now, so lunch on me. <laughs> <laughs> Post Omicron. Can't wait. Can't wait. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you by the work. Jake, David, thank you all so, so much for coming to Open Book, Open Mind for this electrifying discussion. It was so inspiring and also so challenging. Um, and uh, thank, I also want to shout out to the audience because as I always say, without you, we're nothing. Um, and um, we will be, people have asked, we will make this conversation available on our YouTube channel and everybody who has signed up for the, um, the program will receive a follow-up letter with a link um, to it. And Jake and Khalil, you two both referenced some important links and um, a couple of books. We would like to make those available to our audience as well, if that's possible. Um, and um, so I just wanna say, this is the moment where, yes, we are a library, we give it all away, but if you wanna support the writers that you care about, the ideas that you care about, if you want these ideas to keep going out into the world and you want people to keep coming back to this program, then consider buying their book. Um, we, um, it's available for sale by our partner, Watch on Booksellers, and it's also available to borrow through the library. But to me, the most, the greatest compliment you can pay an author is to want to own a copy of their book. Um, and that's all I can say about it. Finally, um, we hope you'll join us for our next event with Rutgers professor Caitlin Petrie talking about her new book, All the News That's Fit to Click, how metrics are transforming the work of journalists. 
She'll be talking with Andrew Morantz of The New Yorker on Tuesday, January 25th at 7 p.m. Um, be well, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks again. Thank you. Take care.